Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Applications of Microphysiological Systems for Respiratory Drug Discovery, Opportunities and Challenges, presented by Dr. David Rollins, Senior Investigator and Group Leader, Respiratory Biology, Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rollins. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, giving me the opportunity to present to you today and discuss the, the application of such NPS systems uh, to respiratory drug discovery. Um, and I'd really like to highlight some of the, the opportunities um, that the, this kind of technology offers to drug discovery, um, but also discuss some of those challenges. So, first of all, of course, the, the lung is a, is a highly complex organ. It's um, uniquely evolved to support its primary functions, first of all, in terms of gas exchange. And you can see from this image, it, it's a um, fluorescent micrograph of um, an alveolus. And you can see the, the red fluorescence is actually the endothelial surface. Um, and it's actually a very thin barrier. Um, and this is, of course, highly evolved to, to provide a minimum distance for oxygen and CO2 to diffuse across um, to enable gas exchange. And of course, this is really a critical role in ensuring and, and maintaining tissue oxygenation throughout the body. So of course, blood coming in and surrounding the alveolus will, um, it will release CO2 that diffuses across into the alveolus, um, which then removed as we exhale, um, bringing oxygen actually back into the alveolus when we breathe in. Um, and then this, of course, then reoxygenates blood going out um, into the systemic circulation. In addition to its role in regulating gas exchange, um, the lung obviously being directly exposed to the atmosphere has a key role in uh, sensing the external environment and responding to pathogens has a very critical role in host defense. So of course, um, when we look further down into the lung at a cellular level, we see again this complexity further actually in terms of the, the evolution of the cell types lineages throughout the lung is actually uniquely evolved to support particular functions of the lung and throughout the airway tree. First of all, looking at the upper portion of the lung and the lung, the epithelial surface that is directly uh, facing the gas exchange area, gas uh, oxygen area, uh, is, is uh, really populated with cells that either express uh, these ciliated brush uh, structures that you can see in this electron micrograph uh, that serve a critical role in beating and moving particles out of the airway. The other major cell type in this upper airway are actually goblet cells that produce mucus. Mucus has a critical role in trapping particulate matter, um, and then the cilia can beat and actually move this mucus up the airway tree where we might swallow it and, and remove it from potentially uh, damaging uh, the, the, the epithelial cells further down the airway tree. So, so really the, the lung throughout the airway tree it really has a very kind of highly evolved um, structure and function. Again, if you look down at the gas exchange area that I mentioned on the previous slide, you can see here that the alveolus is made up of two principal cell types, alveolar epithelial type 1 cells and alveolar type 2 cells. Type 2 cells are really responsible for producing surfactant, which lines the alveolus, reduces surface tension, and keeps the alveoli open. So again, another critical role in maintaining gas exchange. Okay, so what we're looking at on this slide is actually the, 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 the structural remodeling that occurs within the lung under certain disease states. So you can see on the left-hand side, we're looking at histology sections of patients with COPD, cystic fibrosis, and asthma, and down at the bottom, interstitial fibrosis. 
And so first of all, on the left hand side, what we what we see is really a greatly uh, thicken, increased thickening of the two muscle cell layer around these large airways. So it provides this restrictive effect on the lung tissue. Uh, in addition to which, there's an inflammation uh, and disorganization of the epithelium. And if we look at the asthma section, you can see this blue staining there, and that's actually a, a mucus plug that, that forms in the airway of, of, of these patients. There's expansion of these goblet uh, cells within the conducting airway that produce large amounts of mucus and can completely occlude the flow of air um, through the lung. Uh, and so, and then moving further down to the bottom, the, the pulmonary fibrosis uh, section that you see there, this is a disease that really affects the alveolar gas exchange region um, and, and actually has the effect of thickening the, the distance that oxygen has to diffuse through um, across this interstitial barrier. So if you remember on the previous slide that I showed you this very thin membrane through which um, oxygen diffuses, it's greatly enlarged in that disease state. So, of course, the net downstream effect is to reduce gas exchange and tissue, tissue oxygenation. So, so I think hopefully what you can appreciate from these histological sections is actually the complexity of these structural changes that occur in the lung. You've got through muscle cell expansion, um, epithelial lineage changes, there's also mucus accumulation, inflammatory cell influx, so very complicated multicellular processes. And this becomes a real challenge for us in thinking about um, designing and uh, testing new therapies that target these mechanisms that would really provide benefit to patients in the long run that go beyond existing standard of care, which primarily target uh, the kind of airway constriction or um, inflam inflammatory effects associated with these diseases. And so, like respir respiratory drug discovery is very similar to drug discovery in other um, diseases and uh, somatic areas, there's a high degree of attrition. Uh, what typically we typically start out with uh, screening and running a high throughput screen. We, uh, upwards of a million compounds are often profiled. Um, we then uh, take the promising leads out of the HTS strategy, progress them through a preclinical pipeline, which is really the role that I, I, I support within the respiratory department at, at NIVA. Uh, and really thinking about ways that we can triage compounds coming up with assays in vitro and in vivo to make informed decisions about which compounds to ultimately progress. Uh, really out of these uh, kind of uh, the smaller subset of compounds, only one or two would ultimately progress from toxicology studies into the clinical domain, uh, and then eventually if successful onto FDA review. But you see overall there's a high degree of attrition as we move forward, and, and, and of course this is a very long process. And so one thing I'm very interested in is thinking about um, ways that we can make more informed decisions around compounds to progress, improving the translatability of assays and models that we use to choose between compounds, and, and hopefully expedite um, drug discovery efforts um, through, through these initiatives. So just to discuss those points in a, in a bit more detail, you'll see on this slide is a, a typical um, drug discovery flow chart that we'd normally use. Um, again, starting with a target of, of, of interest, we'd establish a HTS assay format, screen large numbers of compounds. From an in vitro standpoint, often move this into, into lead optimization uh, to progress really advanced, uh, advanced hits out of the HTS. Within the lead optimization bucket, you would typically have maybe biochemical assays and um, cell line experiments, and then standard sort of primary cell assays, um, and it would be typically around 96 well, if cells grown in plastic, potentially with one or two very simple readouts. And often we end up with a fair number of compounds to then test in vivo, um, either through um, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic assays, um, to really determine target engagement, understand how PK properties affect that. Uh, and then from there, progress into toxicology ultimately. And then if the compound is, de is deemed suitably safe, ultimately on into phase one, first in man studies. And what I'd like to do is just discuss our kind of typical approach that we've been taking around uh, lead optimization, vivo pharmacology, and this preclinical space that I mentioned I've been primarily focused on, and really where we view um, these microfluidic systems and microphysiological assays could be uh, applicable to kind of expedite um, efforts in that space. So first of all, we would typically, um, you can see on this, on this assay, this, this slide actually, we, one, one primary cell assay we typically use, like in other, in other disease areas, we grow airway epithelial cells um, in, in culture. These are typically fairly low throughput assays. Just to explain here what we're looking at, we typically grow human bronchial epithelial cells on these transwell inserts that you can see on the, on the schematic on the right-hand side. 
they grow to confluency under submerged conditions, but we actually remove the apical um, media compartment around seven days into culture. And if you leave these cells for a further a, a couple of weeks um, out, they start to differentiate to produce ciliated and goblet cells that you remember I explained earlier really make up the, uh, the major cell types, epithelial cell types um, in the conducting airway. And this confocal image nicely demonstrates that. The red fluorescence is showing the, um, where the cilia are actually present um, and the green and yellow the goblet cells that um, form and produce mucus. On the right hand side, you'll see a, a video shortly, which really shows that even under these static conditions, you can see cilia beating. If we just play that movie now. Okay, and so um, what you'll see there is the cilia beating um, in, in unison. Um, but really one of the, the, the key challenges that we face with, the, with this assay culture system is really the it's relatively low throughput, but you're only, of course, dealing with um, one of the cell types involved in formation of these remodeled areas of the lung in disease. So it's really very, a very simplified way of, of looking at a disease mechanism in the lung. And, 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 and typically, we would, from then, we would move on into in vivo pharmacology studies or pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic type studies. Um, and again, for, for, with lung uh, kind of, uh, endpoints, there are a number of, uh, of standard approaches to assessing efficacy of compounds. We typically use um, invasive lung function procedures. Um, is a fact uh, fairly widely used in the, in the community. And um, we may combine that with histological endpoints to assess structural remodeling. But obviously, the, kind of the key issues really hard here are that uh, these are dealing with rodents that are not the same as human. Uh, they really lack the complexity in many cases um, that we see in histological specimens from human lungs. In terms of in vivo models in general for respiratory, they often entail single administrations of inflammatory agents. Um, and they often progress very fast um, and often can be reversible as well. So it's really, again, a, a very kind of a, a distinct um, pathology to that which we see in humans. So often we use these assays models for optimizing compound properties, selecting maybe a lead molecule to progress further. Um, but there really are still question marks around the translatability uh, of these to the patient setting. And do you wonder if this is actually a, a potential source of a disconnect when we start testing compounds in the clinic down the line? So one way that we've we've been over the last couple of years we've been looking at to try and uh, to try and get around some of these challenges is to think about using ex vivo preparations. So this is a, an initiative we've been working on for the last couple of years, um, and potentially using ex vivo assays and models as a bridge um, to uh, the, the the clinic. And, and the reason being that we think they offer some advantages. You can see here is an example, an isolated perfused lung system that we've, we've used um, in, the, in the department. Um, and it, it, as the name suggests, we, what we're looking at here are rodent lungs that have been removed from the animal and they're ventilated and perfused, so really preserving much of the physiology that you would get in vivo. But the advantage is that they offer a lot of flexibility um, in terms of access to uh, different compartments such as the inhaled route. We can deliver molecules directly to the lung, uh, mimicking inhaled delivery. We can also add compounds directly to the systemic compartment to mimic an oral dose, for instance. Um, and we can directly study the um, uptake and, and penetration of molecules into different compartments in the lung using this method. And so if we then move to the next slide, what we see here is taking this model system a step further forward beyond um, PK and biodistribution studies. We can also use this system to study and probe a um, mechanism of action. In this example, what I'm showing here is where we've taken the isolated perfused lung uh, and uh, been able to combine it with fluorescent microscopy um, to, to directly image the lung tissue in real time. In this experiment, we've perfused the lung with calcium dyes. That's the yellow and green fluorescence that you can see in the image on the right. And we can record um, these calcium responses in real time to assess uh, the regional differences in calcium transients between the vascular and airway compartment that have labeled there on the image. Just to walk you through what that, what that looks like, you can see here that in this experiment, we've actually perfused the lung with tumor necrosis factor alpha. It's a very potent pro-inflammatory stimuli. Um, this then enables us to study direct calcium responses in the lung tissue, um, and particularly of interest to assess the effect of TNF alpha in different compartments of the lung, airway versus vasculature. Um, and you can see here that there clearly there's a strong calcium increase 
And so we can use these types of uh, approaches to then study the effect of pharmacological agents of blocking TNF-alpha signaling and its effectiveness of, of doing this in different regions of the lung. And we also use the isolated perfused lung to probe and other physiological properties of the lung, such as directly measuring lung function. Um, and this is an, an example plot on the right-hand side showing a simple dose response to acetylcholine, uh, which produces a very marked uh, airway constrictor response. Uh, we can also measure edema in real time in this, out, in, this, in this ex vivo assay system. And then the final graph, we can also measure pulmonary hemodynamics to so you can get a very integrated physiological assessment that's not easy to do in an in vivo setting to give you a really depth of understanding about how a compound might be working. And of course, there's a number of ex vivo systems available to respiratory drug discovery, um, isolated perfused lung being one of them. But typically, a lot of the limitations are that um, they, they often have very limited lifespan. The IPL is really only viable for you know, around six hours. So you can extend it up to 24 hours if you alter some of the parameters. Um, tracheal tissues, similarly, they're very useful for very, uh, very short-term experiments. Um, and they're typically also very low throughput. So while they address some of the, the challenges that I highlighted earlier, they're still not kind of getting close to uh, really being able to kind of get a comprehensive uh, physiological system and, and also being able to use human tissue as well. So, so that's really where, how I've become very interested in um, using microphysiological systems to, to try and get us closer to a translational uh, model of lung physiology. And, and just to take a step back from that, the, the, the reason being that, of course, when we typically grow um, primary cells in static culture conditions, you're lacking a lot of the basic physiology that occurs in the lung. There's no mechanical stretch, there's no perfusion, there's no exposure to um, direct exposure to the atmosphere like you would get in the lung. Um, and so some of the approaches to get around this, of course, we can think about using um, organoid systems. Um, and I think these are really kind of uh, you know, great assay systems for kind of replicating a particular cellular niche. And um, there's an example here from uh, you know, a publication a couple of years ago. We were able to, to um, grow human airway epithelial cells, bronchial epithelial cells in this case, and, and maintain the, um, the niche that they would typically occupy in the normal lung producing ciliated and goblet cells and, and releasing mucus, which is the green fluorescence that you can see. So I think the great is the mimicking in the, the physiological microenvironment of the airway, um, and also this potential scalability with the organoids to at least the, kind of the 384 well assay format to be able to run larger screens. But they're still, kind of, still deficient in certain physiological mechanisms and thinking about translatability to the whole lung. Uh, and that, is, that includes, um, for example, parameters such as um, the stretch forces that the lung is normally exposed to as we breathe. And so you see here an example from the, um, the Wies Institute um, here in Cambridge that published uh, the lung and the chip model back in 2010. Um, and it's a really elegant uh, assay system. So a small chip-based system that includes a, a porous membrane, very thin membrane, about 10 microns in thickness. And of course, what you can do here is to grow airway epithelial cells in, in, in close proximity with endothelial cells. And um, so you can really mimic, for example, the alveolus of the lung um, using this, this approach. And for me, the, some of the major advantages here is that the, the chip is connected to a pump, so you can actually perfuse um, the chip through the vascular compartment, and the endothelial cells below are directly exposed to, uh, to, the, to normal flow um, mechanisms, normal flow forces that uh, actually have clear biological effects on endothelial cells that can affect polarization, intracellular signaling effects. And so it's a very important physiological property. Similarly, with the airway channel, you can also um, force through air to mimic the effect of forced air breathing on it's really kind of the effect of airflow on, on the lung epithelium. And again, this also has effects too in terms of signaling and uh, phenotypic alterations on, on the lung that's closer to, to what we'd see in the intact lung. And I think the, the, the really kind of key bit here is the stretchability to really mimic the, uh, the dynamic forces that these cells are normally exposed to. So you can really imagine it's a very uh, clear advantage over and above these static monocultures that would, you know, typically have been used to, um, to support drug discovery in respiratory.
So for the next couple of slides, I'd really like to just highlight a couple of, um, I think, really nice examples of where um, such systems have been used um, that would be applicable to drug discovery. Um, and so the, the first approach here, the microphysiological system, really being a system capable of emulating human physiology. And, and I think that's, that's really uh, very kind of re really reflective of this lung on a chip technology, combining these physiological forces with um, human primary cells. Um, and you can also, of course, substitute wild type cells for COPD or IPS cells, for instance, if you can get access to those patient derived cells. And so in this example here, it's actually a, um, an application around toxicology. I think it's a very, a very nice one. Um, in this case, um, it's, it's looking at the, an on-target issue associated with IL-2, which is used to treat certain forms of cancer. So what IL-2 does in the lung is to increase um, barrier permeability, um, and it, it makes patients predisposed to developing edema in the airway, so where the lungs fill with fluid and impair gas exchange ultimately. So it's, a, so, it's a, so it's an important problem associated with this type of approach. And what you can see here in, in, in panel B, that um, the team used this, uh, the lung on a chip technology with the airway epithelium grown in close association with the endothelium. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, you see there that there's a bright field view of the, um, of, the, of the epithelial surface looking down into the chip. So really nice confluent cells grown in this system. And the, the assay design here is that the team perfused the system with IL-2 through the vascular compartment, but that through this bright field imaging, they're actually able to image the onset of edema in the chip. So if you see on the, on the margins of um, the, the figure on day one, that's labeled day one, you see very clear margins um, that really define the boundary of where um, there's a meniscus due to the fluid and actually the epithelial surface it, we can clearly see on the top. Over time with IL-2 treatment, uh, those, the margins of meniscus, the fluid layer, starts to expand and starts to take over the entire surface of the chip. By day four, you don't even see the cells anymore because it's completely covered by uh, fluid. And, and then the bottom, path, uh, the bottom panel there, the team nicely demonstrated the other um, mechanism associated with IL-2 treatment is actually increased uh, fibrin matrix deposition in the alveolar regions. And so what they did here was to perfuse the chips with uh, prothrombin and fibrinogen alongside IL-2, and were able to very nicely and clearly show uh, formation of these fibrin clots on the alveolar epithelial surface of the chips. So I think this, this to me really highlights a very nice application of this system where you can actually replicate um, a toxicology finding that's observed in rodents in this um, chip system where you're using human cells um, and, and of course it reduces the need to, to test those types of uh, approaches in, a, in animals, you can replicate it here. I think as well, it could be broader applications too in thinking about um, drugs or therapies to target pulmonary edema as well. This type of approach may be applicable there as well. And so moving on to a second example, um, what, we're, what we're looking at here is a, a really a, 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 an example of where the a team have used the lung on the chip technology to study efficacy of potential new therapies to treat asthma. And so in this experiment, what they're doing is taking a, the lung on the chip technology, growing um, primary um, epithelial cells uh, on the air surface, endothelial cells again on the, the blood channel that we can see there, it's labeled, they're perfused with blood um, and also of course air is, is blown across the surface of the epithelial layer. The uh, panel's D and E nicely show that the, there are intact monolayers of both the epithelium and the endothelium. I think what's really nice about this uh, approach, if you look at panel F, you clearly see the, remember the example that I showed you earlier the, uh, of ciliated epithelium here, that we nicely see um, a large amount of ciliated cells, which is the green fluorescence that we can see these tufts of cilia. And uh, there's an electron micrograph in panel G, which shows very high degree of ciliation, um, which is quite reflective of what we see if you take a human lung tissue um, and stain it up for these types of markers. You see very dense layers of dense areas of ciliated epithelium. And panel H um, shows uh, that, in fact, these cilia are functionally active as well. It's a time-lapse image series showing that these cilia are all beating in unison and, and, and in a very coordinated way.
And it's actually quite distinct from um, uh, what we've seen typically in, in human airway epithelial cells grown in these standard transwell inserts that I showed you on a, a few slides ago. That you don't typically see such a high degree of um, ciliated epithelial formation. And also the cilia can often be in a, in a fairly um, discordant way. And, and, and we believe this is really due to the fact that um, if you, it, this chip-based system, the lungs exposed to normal mechanical forces that so they would be in vivo. So it helps cilia align with the direction of flow or airflow in this case. Um, so it gives us a much more I think, physiologically relevant um, system here. But to get into the key experiment here, what the team did was to expose the, um, the, the chip to IL-13. Interleukin-13 is a, is a major pro-inflammatory cytokine that's highly upregulated in asthmatic patients. What it does on the airway epithelium is to promote the differentiation of airway epithelial cells into goblet cells. So it really drives um, goblet cell formation at the expense of ciliated cells. So of course, what you can see from that, the, the downstream effect of that phenotype is really that the, um, you're going to get much more mucus produced in the airway, and you're just not going to have enough cilia to remove that mucus. So you start to get a lot of mucus build up in the airway, which is really a, a classic hallmark of, an, of, of asthmatic patients, which are nicely replicating here. And it's also quantified in the image below, in the, in the figure below. Um, and, and, and in terms of the compounds that were tested here, there's a nice example that the um, chip is also exposed to um, a steroid, dexamethasone, which is uh, really a standard of care in asthma, although there's a large number of patients that unfortunately don't respond to dexamethasone as a treatment. And you can see here that um, the, the dex group is actually not reducing the number of goblet cells. But interestingly, the tool test the, two, the, the, the test compounds that were added here, so it's a JAK1 inhibitor, uh, which is a novel target that's been identified um, uh, as playing a role in this goblet cell formation. You can see it's really giving quite a robust um, reduction in a number of goblet cells. And, and what I really liked about this uh, you know, publication overall is that you, they're really kind of demonstrating the power of this system that you can combine um, these types of uh, readouts in terms of uh, looking at the number of goblet cells with um, real-time functional data, so looking at the physiology in real time, so that's cilia beating in this case. Um, and we can see very nicely that um, the, the uh, JAK1 inhibitor is dose-dependently increasing cilia beat frequency um, as, the, as it's reversing the number of goblet cells in the chip system. So altogether, you get a much more comprehensive picture of what's going on here as you start to explore new therapies for these diseases, not only looking at the number of goblet cells, but also looking at the downstream physiology. So I think that's pretty promising as a potential way to, uh, to triage compounds down the line, perhaps really looking at a more competitive physiological system, such as the microphysiological system, um, to, to select compounds for in vivo testing, perhaps. So that brings me back to, um, to, to this, uh, this flow chart that I showed at the beginning, a typical flow chart of how drug discovery projects may be progressed in, in respiratory. Um, and, and coming back to some of the new approaches that could be adopted here, I do you think, there is, for example, looking at using organoids, I mentioned that they could replicate um, some of the airway niches that occur in a normal lung, keeping cells in their physiological microenvironment, um, but also having a scalability um, aspect too, so it could be applicable for um, you know, maybe even HTS activities if we can scale them to, to, to such a level. Um, and then, of course, it's very applicable for lead optimization activities using primary cells grown in this format. I think the power of the microphysiological systems, I think they do really plug into these later stage activities in the flow chart. That, um, they, could be, they could be really used to uh, assess um, multiple physiological parameters um, of lead compounds that are coming out of a HTS. Um, ultimately kind of feeding into compound selection for in vivo testing and, and also maybe uh, uh, reducing uh, or kind of test or as a pretest for compounds going into toxicology studies. I think right now the field as it's currently stood, uh, but I don't think there's quite enough data yet to be able to say that um, these assays and technologies could replace um, existing in vivo or uh, toxicology studies. But I think certainly the field has moved on to a point where it's really worth going through the exercise to test compounds and building up correlations to see how well compounds perform in these assays um, as compared to in vivo studies um, and in toxicology experiments to see if there is um, a way that they could ultimately kind of become a mainstay in, in these drug discovery flowcharts. 
I think in order to, to really move the field on, there's still a number of um, areas for development around MPS technology in general. Um, it's fairly, you know, really, fairly widely acknowledged. Right now, the, uh, the, the, kind of the microfluidic um, lung and chip type technology is fairly low throughput. Um, if we're thinking about doing dose responses, for example, dose response analysis of lead compounds, talking about potentially a, a quite a fair number of, of, of chips, which um, it, it has a, a kind of a substantial cost associated with that as it currently stands. So perhaps coupled with that, chip manufacturer and um, evolution of, uh, of the, the kind of the synthesis of these chips and increasing scale may ultimately drive down cost in the future. In addition to which innovation around um, alternative ways to perfuse the chip, so that maybe miniaturizing pumps to um, uh, kind of increase the throughput could also be um, really an advantageous to really move this field further along as well. Um, and then I think for particularly a neat challenge for um, lung delivery is actually um, mimicking inhaled uh, delivery. That I think is still a challenge actually being able to um, mimic the direct addition of a dry powder, for instance, that a patient might take um, uh, you know, for, to reduce airway tone currently in the clinic. So I think trying to um, build in capabilities to mimic inhalation delivery would also be a, a key necessity as this technology moves forward. And so I'd like to end there and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Rollins, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Now, before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2019. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.